very welcome. Um, and thank you for being here almost on time. We gave you the 15 traditional minutes to wake up. My name is Rosie Braidot. It's my pleasure to be your chair for this morning. <laughs> Uh, to the full day of activities. Welcome to our distinguished panelists and uh, to the team that continues tirelessly to keep us through the work and the heat wave. Uh, rules of the game stay the same. Uh, you have your allocated time of max 40 minutes. Any minute after that will be great, under that will be greatly appreciated in view of the heat. And the respondent, um, again, uh, 20, 25 minutes. Um, I would advise you to look at the outlines of the speakers in the conference package so that I don't have to read these overwhelmingly intimidating CVs of the distinguished speakers we have at this conference. And the first, and it's a great pleasure to welcome her as a dear friend as well as an esteemed colleague, Athena Athanasiou from uh, Pantheon University in Athens. Uh, on public institution defending what is yet to come. Welcome, and I'll introduce the others as your turn comes. Thank you so much, Rosie, for this introduction. Thank you all for being here. Thanks to Judith and Rosie for inviting me to this uh, wonderful event. Um, so the public institution defending what is yet to come. Along with many others of my generation in the southeastern European corner of this world where I grew up, I had to go not only to, but also, and perhaps more significantly, beyond the university to be able to think and study together with others. We had to enact our commitment to the insurgent potential of theory in the streets and other heterotopias of self-knowledge and alternative theory and politics. Against the afterlives of the dictatorship and ongoing forms of authoritarianism that the public university sustained, we had to refuse to learn our lesson of universal values epitomized throughout the guiding paradigms of Eurocentric humanism, possessive and self-possessive individualism, the nationalist and classicist canon, heteronormativity, and anti-communist middle-class professionalization. We had to protest within and against the epistemopolitical promises, sorry, the epistemopolitical premises that founded the university institution in general and the humanities in particular. And so, affirming the critical embodied situatedness rather than a universal space of the university, I would like to ask, how are such configurations of alternative humanities and critical epistemologies most notably feminist, queer, anti-racist, post-human, and post-colonial, decolonial studies, conveyed within current epistemic and political exercises in defending the humanities and the public good of education from the neoliberal, neoliberal governmentality. In the context of the current mod modality of governance, also known as the, the crisis, an appellation that relies precisely through its definite article on a Eurocentric definition of what counts as crisis. The axiomatic logics and logistics of metrics becomes a technique of governmentality, often under the name of structural reform. In Nicholas Rose's apt formulation, neoliberal rationalities, I quote, require a numericized environment in which these free choosing actors may govern themselves by numbers. End of quote. The will to magic power retains an uncanny resonance with Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels' characterization of the bourgeoisie in the Communist Manifesto as that which dissolves everything in the icy water of egotistical calculation. Metrics now authenticates institutions, subjectivities, dispositions, and one's sense of worth. It attests to self-realization and self-responsibility in the context of pervasive market economy. It is through governance by metrics that knowledge production becomes implicated in the new bureaucracy of neoliberal pragmatism. Against this background, I would like to ask how a politics of the incalculable might be mobilized as a critique 
of managerial and marketized calculation and how it might become an occasion for thinking critique in an era of neoliberal capitalism. Drawing on the criticalities inscribed in the dialectics of calculation and the incalculable, I would like to gesture here towards the aporias of the topos and trope of university as an apparatus that is increasingly devalued under the forces of neoliberalization and at the same time as a liberal mode of social reproduction and valorization that distributes value unevenly by devaluing those on the wrong side of humanist entitlement in terms of class, race, gender, sexuality, geopolitical positioning, species, health, or ability. I'm, sub I'm submitting here uh, to you then a thesis which involves forestalling at once the epistemic violences of the academy and the nihilistic anti-institutional drive which is fully compatible with the era of the demise of public higher education and the, and the agenda of the right. Although my call is to work with the aporetic mode of institutionality, this is not simply to be construed as a logical contradiction, but rather performatively as a summons to ethical and political engagement. To this extent, I would like to dwell on the question of how to defend the humanities from the calculus of austerity, neoliberal corporatization, and institutional cutbacks, and yet remain attuned to the critique of institutionalized universalist humanism. In order to reckon with the attack on the humanities through the perspective of a left-wing theoretical anti-humanism, I would like to caution against positing the humanities as a singular and homogeneously endangered institution and suggest possible ways of accounting for multiple, variously situated, conflicting humanities, to use Rosie Bright Otis and Paul Gilroy's apt term. The field of the humanities is contested and conflictual and thus not defendable as such. What is at stake is how one positions herself within the field of power relations and contestations that the humanities are. The radical epistemologies of feminist, queer, anti-racist, post-human, deconstructionist, post-colonial and decolonial studies in their transdisciplinary and transversal assemblages have long challenged the ontological grounds of the humanist model of humanities. They have reconfigured the politics of knowledge production and distribution by interro interrogating the anthropocentric, Eurocentric, colonial, classicist, and heteronormative epistemological frameworks of the humanities. And by bringing forth different inflections and diffractions of human and humanities across geographical, ethnic, racial, and sexual boundaries. Such critical analytics have incited us to envision the humanities beyond the phallogocentric and Eurocentric epistemic privilege of man, which has rendered other ways of living and thinking unthinkable and impossible. Alternative humanities provide pathways into the project of reimagining the terms of the human and humanities from the unsettled historical positioning of what Trin Min Ha has called inappropriate, inappropriated others. As Donna Haraway explains, I quote, to be an inappropriate slash inappropriated other means to be in critical, deconstructive relationality in a diffracting rather than reflecting rationality as the means of making potent connection that exceeds domination, end of quote. Let me phrase it as clearly as I can. Defending the humanities does not warrant the restoration of the universal man of the liberal humanist canon. Hinging on histories of agonistic engagements and critical epistemologies within the humanities, I want to ask, what does it mean to defend the humanities 
from an agonistic position of institutional marginality and eccentricity. How can we rethink the political implications of such ambivalent and indeed conflictual belonging? And also, how can we shift from both institu institutionalization and anti-institutionalism toward engaging in creative acts of instituting differently? It remains to be seen in what ways we might rethink the public institution in the sense of non-unitary, different, differentiated counterpublics beyond incorporation and normalization, given that institutionalization is a dominant technique of incorporating the dissident. We need to no longer conceive of institutions as fixed unitary and localizable entities inside of which we find ourselves, but also as those discursive and affective formations that are inside of us, as it were, constantly articulated through us, embodied and performed by us. And we need to remain aware of the conflictual and indeed hierarchized character of the public. Consider, for instance, the different institutional articulations of a university, a prison, and a gay cruising area. Instead of the structural matrices of interiority versus exteriority vis-a-vis -vis the institution, however, I would like to think my way through a modality of performative engagement that crosses through the institution of the university and its universal claims to truth. Mobilizing the ontopolitical tension between defending and unsettling what is, I would like to think of these two modalities together as an inextricable and irreconcilable relationship. In this framework of transversal analysis, defending, especially when, when what is to be defended emerges as a threatened object does not become a justification for conserving, safekeeping, and further monumentalizing what is. It does not become a justification for uncritically reinstating the university's narcissistic monopoly on the production of knowledge. And it does not become a justification for dispensing with a critical questioning of the university's universalist pretensions and institutionalized routines of inequality, exclusion, and exploitation. This mode of defending the institution does not become a justification for not imagining differently, for not instituting otherwise. It commands a break with the snares of institutionalization and the microphysics of power that lets the institution become totalizing and the left become defensive and backward looking. Rather than adherence to a universal moral imperative, defending here involves the agonistic political imaginary and work on what is not yet and what is to come, that is what is always already underway, overlooked, marginalized and fugitive. In this modality of defending public institutions from corporatization and reactionary anti-humanities, at work is a form of institutional dispossession, as Rosie Braidotti and Paul Giroy again lucidly put it. We try to show in our uh, book, Dispossession, with Judith Butler, the political underpinnings of becoming dispossessed of that which was never once owned. In this sense, to defend is to assert a relation with that which was never ultimately defendable in the first place. Defending here does not stem from some ontology of lost completeness and totality. It rather yields a form of promise. Promise, again, however, is not to be understood as one more instantiation of left-wing melancholy, which Benjamin famously defined as a pseudo-revolutionary nihilism, 
promise is not an occasion for self-reassuring anticipation of loss and defeat, which keeps one out of the battlefield and in a fantasy of an absolute distance from institutions. Rather, promise is to be understood as a performative act which necessitates a shift from a totalizing logocentric realm of authorial intentionality into the realm of a political action that reckons indefinitely with the historical circumstances of the possible. I would like to dwell on the institution as a performative way to claim having things in common beyond unity and closure while troubling the, presump the presumptions of commonness and propriety at a moment when the conditions of possibility of being in common are being destroyed. In an era of thorough, thoroughgoing neoliberal crisis management that, that wears out not only bodies and minds, but also the very affective capacity to imagine and institute otherwise. Public institutions are considered unaffordable and redundant by market standards. As public institutions are privatized or subcontracted by governments to private agents, the common perception of the neoliberal right posits that if the funding of institutions is withdrawn, then self-management will thrive. In other words, according to the neoliberal right, defunding allows the fittest to excel by means of entrepreneurial self-sufficiency. Although our lives depend on institutional support for survival, or even more than survival, however, institutions also expose lives to structural violence, unequal distribution of resources and affects, and therefore uphold intersecting class, citizenship, racialized, and heteronormative privileges. When we lay claim to institutions then, are these claims bound to affirm the biopolitics of simultaneous sustaining and damaging the conditions of life? How can these claims adequately account for the institution's involvement in the politicization and economization of life within the globalized distribution of capital, resources, and bodies? What complicates our critical task under current conditions of intensifying precarity is that institutions do not simply sustain the conditions of life, but rather are actively implicated in the institution of long-term inequality and disenfranchisement. And so the question becomes, how can we survive the violent terms of social intelligibility that the institutionalization of neoliberal rationality works tacitly naturalize and moralize? And finally, how does our radical, our radical political critique survive institutionalization? In Judith Butler's words, I quote, this is why the demand is not for all kinds of infrastructure, since some serve the decimation of livable life. Military forms of detention, imprisonment, occupation, and surveillance, for instance, and some support livable lives, livable life. End of quote. I would like to propose that what is dispossessed when public institutions are corporatized is not simply the practices, venues, and affective registers attached to them, but also, importantly, the very conditions of possibility for their democratic tra transformation in response to what interminably remains to be resisted. Sorry, I missed the, the, the line here. Uh, the very conditions of possibility for their democratic transformation, full stop. In losing a public institution, we also lose the possibility of collective mobilization in response to what interminably remains to be resisted, reinvented, reformed, and reinstituted. And so, as much as instituted precarity saturates our lives under neoliberalism, 
by rigidifying already existing inequalities and producing new ones, we cannot simply give up on the institutions that have been implicated in our suffering despite or precisely through their commitment to public interest. This double bind produces a potentially creative challenge for instituting otherwise, compelling an ambivalent positionality of with, within, against. That is, a spectral political location of both proximity and distance, which would allow us to deauthorize the institutions normalizing violence while at the same time resisting the neoliberal market rationality that depletes non-market institutions. This is particularly crucial as the destruction of non-market institutions is often paired with the inauguration of new non-instituted institutions that are impervious to democratic accountability. The Eurogroup is a notorious example of non-instituted, non-elected, non-accountable institution in, 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 at the heart of the European Union. In other words, what seems to be at stake is a critical redefinition of the institution as a particular topos of long-term interpellation and disenfranchisement according to norms of race, ethnicity, class, gender, sexuality, and at the same time as a complex constellation of transversal, uneasy interiority and uncanny occupation. This requires that we critically question the classical disjunctive mode that often marks the language and imagination of political contestation, namely the binarism between either working within immanent conditions or from a presumptively pure outside. In different but inter interrelated contexts of the present conditions, such as the Occupy movements, and the challenge posed by the possibility of forming left governments in Europe, the enactment of the institution has become a site of intense collective reflection on how to institute otherwise under conditions of impossibility. In both these contexts, occupying an institution cannot be reduced to simply being part of the institution or becoming like the institution or even occupying the position of its internal token of difference. Occupying does not denote a heroic and miraculous conquest of the institution and it is not about seizing state power or state institutions as such but neither is it about assuming a pure, non-institutional and anti-institutional form of action. In other words, occupying here might be seen as a possible way out of the strict and assertive demarcation between horizontal and vertical modes of political mediation and participation and toward more inquate, plastic and transversal forms and vocabularies of political subjectivity. In its fight against neoliberal deinstitutionalization, anti-neoliberal politics rightly assumes the position of defending public institutions while criticizing their long-term normative unreliability or complicity with state violence. The recent Academics for Peace call to boycott the Turkish higher education system is a suggestive example we might have time to talk about that later. As I tried to unravel before, this modality of defending takes the form of safeguarding the object of one's critique by defending not only what already exists, but also what is to be reclaimed and what is to be instituted anew. The ambivalent mode of engaging with the institution by, by not being at home in institutions and not being at home with oneself in institutions indicates a performative reconfiguration of institutions as indeterminate sites of conflict. How do we critically engage the way in which institutions institute then? And how can institutions be instituted differently? 
I would argue that the critical performativity of working with and within the institution against the logics of institutionalization involves a twofold move. On the one hand, acting here and now as if it were possible, in Jacques Derrida's words, to keep the question of the institution open as an interminably aporetic call for another politics that simultaneously performs and resists the institution. And on the other hand, posing again and again the question that Hannah Arendt was reported to have, to have once asked, what will we lose if we win? Although Arendt's formulation implies her conflicted stance about gender politics and feminism, that was the context in which she phrased that, I propose to reinstate it in a somewhat different manner as a way of acknowledging our finitude against power while also mobilizing our finitude against that power. Arendt's question alerts us to the undecidable ambivalence of the object of our political commitment and desire. It also indicates the need to constantly guard against the institutionalization of our attachments and standpoints, especially in the face of victory. Seen through this twofold perspective, namely, as if it were possible, and what will we lose if we win? The political performativity of coming together and instituting otherwise retains a valuable affinity with the contingencies of what is yet to come. The new forms of resistance and political activism that have recently emerged in and in and around the university demand and enact the real the reallocation of institutional resources in the wake of neoliberal dispossession. One of these activist forms, the book block, attempted to defend and open up the space of the university. In this street action, protesters marched through the streets of various cities wearing mock books as shields in defense of public universities and libraries and against um, tuition increases that exclude disenfranchised students from higher education. I'm going to show some images. Sandro, this is not a PowerPoint, if Sandro is around, okay. Just images, not, not a PowerPoint. I hate it too. Um, a particular image of the book block captures the spirit of this street performance, depicting a policeman depicting a policeman raising his baton against the protester carrying a sign of Derrida's book, Spectres of Marx. Chasing Spectres of Marx, the figure of the policeman unwittingly re-embodies the Derridian claim that the Spectres of Marx and Marxism are indeed disturbingly undead. By taking to the streets and thus repositioning their bodies in the public space, these academic workers, non-tenured faculty and indebted students came together to defend the unconditionality of the university against neoliberal attempts to expropriate it. There is no doubt that universities have always been places of entrenched authority, privilege and disciplinary knowledge production organized around some theological political form of sovereignty such as God, the law, the state, the empire, or private capital. But the question is, what performative powers are mobilized to lay claim to alternative and plural humanities, where the term humanities indicates both a critical and epistemological alternative to high culture and a critique of normative configurations of what counts as human. The key trope of the book block, rendering written texts publicly accessible, ambivalently evokes the last scene in Francois Truffaut's 1966 filmic adaptation of Fahrenheit 451, where a group of people amble through the woods, each reciting or becoming a book they have learned by heart in order to keep it alive. 
Based on the 1953 futuristic novel by Ray Bradbury, the film takes place in a hypothetical totalitarian and anti-intellectual society where the government seeks out and destroys all literature. Affected by an encounter with a young dissident school teacher who was fired for her unorthodox teaching methods, uh, she, engaged in, uh, she engaged her students in discussion instead of making them recite. Uh, one of the firemen, a member of, her, of the brigade whose duty is to locate and burn all books, begins to hide books in his house and read them. The fireman becomes a convert to reading and a book collector and eventually joins the book people, a clandestine group of fugitives, each of whom has selected and memorized the book in order to save it from the ashes. Oops. Julie Christie in the role of the, um, the dissident school teacher. The book collector refusing to leave her house, opting instead to die with her books. Um, I would like to insist on my line of questioning, however. How does the conservation of the written word become inadvertently engaged in the authorization of regulatory discursive inheritances? The, this question is not posed by Trifo's film, which focuses on the, violences, the violence of book burning rather than deconstructing the regulative forces of authorship. Nevertheless, a reading of Fahrenheit 451 through the lens of the book block allows us to resituate the question of mnemonic and corporeal inscription beyond the typographic and bibliophilic protocols of the archive. As the medium of storage is extended from text to affective embodied practice, critical textualities might emerge to reload the archive. In considering how we embody and reactivate the book, I want to turn to a question that Derrida has posed, what about the book to come? For Derrida, the to come is linked to spectrality, the figure of the event, the unanticipated coming of the other and the notion of l'avenir, which denotes the coming of the impossible as a condition of the possible. Derrida never tired of elucidating that the im of the impossible is not purely negative and does not simply signal the opposite of the possible, but rather introduces into the possible. The l'avenir of books coming out of the libraries and taking to the streets invokes Derrida's characterization of literature as a space where performative acts are based neither on institutionalized sanctions nor on the authority of the performing subject. As he writes, I quote, the space of literature is not only that of an instituted fiction, but also a fictive institution. It is an institution which tends to overflow the institution." End of quote. The book block opposes the dispossession of the humanities while also reinstituting a space where such dispossessions can count as losses. It defends publicly the right to read, as well as the public institutions within which or because of which different literacies can be generated and valued, and books can be written, read, and thought through. As an attempt to defend, open up, and proliferate the space of public education, the book block street performance resonated with yet another collective action that defended a public institution which, while mobilizing processes of embodied public dissent, at the Istanbul Gezi Park occupation of spring 2013, what began as a protest against plans to remove Taksim Gezi Park turned into an uprising against authoritarianism involving a wide spectrum of protest strategies, including the standing reading protest, in which hundreds of people stood in public spaces reading literature, political philosophy, or daily newspapers.
No doubt, public space, like all institutions, is founded on violences that have scarred its matrix of admissibility and recognizability according to established standards of national capitalist and heteronormative citizenship. What these protests declare, however, is that this is precisely why public space needs to be defended as an infrastructural good in Judith Butler's terms and, and as a site for ongoing struggle. Their action asked what is proper to public space in view of the expropriation of public assets and its re redistributive effects and what resistances to come haunt the social dislocation prompted by this public space's commodification. It is precisely this collective critical intensity dislodged from any heroic and teleological connotations that creates space for the eventness of non-corporate and non-commodified institutions in the face of losing one's means of livelihood, home, health care, or public education. This is the condition of possibility that allows people, books, and also the specters of Marx or the spirit of collective agonism to take to the streets. As we struggle today, jointly and partially through contingent and unconcluded assemblages and reassemblages of anti-capitalism, anti-racism, queerness, and radical democracy, we embody conditions of impossibility as conditions of possibility. It is through such collective commitment to the incommensurate, in, un, to the incommensurate unconditionality of what is yet to come that we ultimately declare as the Invisible Committee put it in a text with which I otherwise disagree, but I like this formulation, we are not depressed, we are on strike. Under the present conditions, critical thought across the world is confronted with what Walter Benjamin called the critical state of the present, whereby what is brought to crisis is not the status quo, but rather the forces engaging in its subversion the forces of possibility. What can we do politically with these crises and defeats then, despite their debilitating logic? How can they be undone and what spaces of possibility are they opening up? It is precisely the urgency of such pressing questions, I think, that compels us to defend the innovative ideas, resources, and affects that the critical humanities have already produced and those yet to come as a site of open, creative, and transformative potential. Thank you very much. Thank you, Athena, for that powerful, inspiring, very well argued paper. What a start. Great pleasure to welcome Andrew Andy Parker to us from Rutgers University the measure of the digital humanities. Welcome. Um, I, I knew it was going to be difficult following Athena. And, um, it's, it's even worse than I thought. Um, this is a wonderful talk. And um, uh, we have um, lots of orientation in common. In, um, um, I was very tempted because I know Fahrenheit 451 very well having taught both the, the, the novel and the film quite often um, of just throwing away my little talk today and then we could just talk about what I, I do think is the brilliant notion of that as a, a figure for the question of the humanities today um, and its defense in which, we, we will say more about this later perhaps, in which the book is defended by burning it because that is what the defenders of the book end up doing as well. They do the exact same things that the opponents of the books do. They burn it so that they memorize it, and the only loss is the materiality of the book. It's an idealist solution to the material problem, but it's, it's, a, it's chilling in any way you think of it. Um, I wanted to say a few opening remarks first um, um, to thank um, Judy and Rosie and all of the people 
um, who have made this a wonderful colloquium. Um, Desidero ringraziare i nostri ospiti per loro generosità. Um, next time I'll be able to do this with a better accent. Um, um, part of what is striking about this gathering is the carefully selected, curated sense of the importance of a diversity of opinions, countries, academic disciplines, and histories of the university in their particular locales. I'm conscious of one of the few who is speaking at this conference in his or her native language. That it is, of course, in the, the, the phrase we like to say, no accident that English is that language today. But that is one of the critical tasks of the university, to reflect on what language means and what one can do with language that hasn't been done yet. Um, a couple of other brief, is it? Sorry. Um, you all heard my sentence of Italian? Okay, that's, that's afraid. Um, Rosara's question yesterday about which university is, of course, a very important question. Um, I, I've had experience in the United States at teaching at two places where the distinction between the public and the private um, uh, is, is very clear. Um, that distinction either doesn't exist in that form elsewhere um, or doesn't exist at all elsewhere, where the only university is the public. It was a tautology to say public university. But the paradox is, at least in the United States, about the public and the private um, are difficult to uh, parse. Where Amherst College, where I, I taught for many years, um, is a rich private institution, so rich that the inroads of the market forces that we've been hearing about are almost imperceptible. Whereas the large state university I teach in today is entirely permeable to those markets. Um, the failed presidential campaign of our governor, Chris Christie, um, uh, uh, he is the person who is the nominal head of our university. Um, in other words, the, somebody with political ambitions and connections to um, the worst in the local um, uh, pharmaceutical industrial complex, which is where New Jersey's money comes from, uh, is never clearer that the contrast with um, genteel old money which is what the, the, the liberal arts private college specializes in. So the, it's difficult to choose, having had this experience. I feel a little like Tiresias, having uh, experienced this in two different ways. But this is one of the paradoxes of education in the United States. The other preamble. is the question of which humanities, because um, there's more than one. Um, I'm, I'm teaching in a department of French and um, chairing a program in comparative literature. Um, I come at these questions in a slightly different way. Um, I, I think to, towards a common end. Um, but I, I'm interested in a kind of question of form, which has material consequences. Um, this is something that people in literature feel a little defensive about, that they do important work too, even though they work on things that are fictional. Um, but um, having said that, um, and um, with your permission, I will tell you a little bit about um, what I'll be doing here now in the talk itself. The, um, the talk will give you some overview about the digital humanities, not knowing whether anybody is um, 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 interested and or conversant in the 
incredibly rapid spread over the past 10 years of work in this um, uh, set of practices. Um, I just, I'm just curious to see if this, a, a show of hands, does any, any of you follow developments in the digital humanities? Good, so you'll see a lot of new things and that's mostly what I wanted to do is to linger on things that I'll, I'll be showing you soon. I'll conclude with a digital project that I'm um, involved in um, and would love to hear your thoughts about that as well. The framing statement for our conference asks the speakers to, quote, evaluate the prevailing metrics of value that increasingly structure and restrict the university in various global locations, unquote. We are further enjoined to, quote, consider how the critical humanities might reflect anew on the public obligations of the university, unquote, obligations that have been imperiled worldwide by, quote, censorship, the suppression of dissenting views, the devaluation of the humanities and arts, and the new metrics of excellence, unquote. The increasing reliance on metrics in contemporary university governance has been very much on our minds of late, so much so that the word was singled out twice for attention within the brief compass of our opening statement. It has certainly been on my mind. I confess to counting the numbers of times that the word metrics occurred in that statement. Counting, however, can only take us so far on the road to knowledge when we cannot decide whether metrics is a singular or a plural noun. As Stanley Fish might ask today, revising the title of a famous essay from the 1970s, what is metrics and why are they saying such terrible things about it? How are we to take the measure of metrics? What do we assume about the value of metrics when we criticize the metrics of value? We have, of course, very good reason to be suspicious about the uses of metrics in a neoliberal era. When the university as a space promoting autonomous critical thinking has suffered unprecedented incursions of free market forces. Under neoliberalism, as Wendy Brown has argued, quote, all conduct is economic conduct. All spheres of existence are framed and measured by economic terms and metrics, even when those spheres are not directly monetized, unquote. If the use of metrics enables the transformation of incomparable qualities into, into comparable quantities, the university may itself be the paradigmatic instance of the process that Brown has described. If that is, we can still say with certainty what or indeed where the university is located today when corporations like Google have absorbed many of its former tasks. Adorno and Horkheimer's culture industry may in certain respects seem quaint, as quaint as the notion of the ivory tower, when computation is both the means and the commodified product of thinking. Nothing may refle reflect these anxieties and questions so clearly within the academy today as the digital humanities, which can be said to have been made possible by the advent of Google Books a decade ago. A Google search this morning for the term digital humanities, or DH, yielded 8.4 million responses should anyone here want to follow up on them, you'll be doing this for a long time. 
frequently described as the application of computational tools and methods to traditional humanities disciplines, such as literature, history, and philosophy, DH has attracted its young life a surprising amount of corporate, state, and philanthropic investment by the Mellon Foundation, amongst others, even as funding for non-DH projects has declined. DH is less a single thing than perhaps a syndrome. There has been much internal debate as to whether it is simply a set of tools, various allied practices, or itself an emergent field. Um, there are now certificate programs and degrees in the digital humanities, undergraduate degrees and master's degrees. Um, its accomplishments have been remarkable in a number of areas, among them network analysis, mapping, text encoding or markup. They've been especially impressive in the visualization of data. And what I'd like to do is to give you some example of, not necessarily at random, but some sites, some sites that I have, um, I, I think will be of some interest here. Um, one of them is um, the webpage for a DH conference, which is now an annual event um, in Leipzig. Um, it has a kind of global um, aspiration that um, is quite similar to our own conference, um, in which it's structured here as a series of workshops in the various major strands of, of uh, DH, uh, as you'll see, um, how to um, mark up text, um, how to um, uh, create um, networks, um, how to um, utilize uh, uh, geospatial mapping. Um, the spatial aspects of DH is one of the most exciting part of the project um, where um, you can use the metrics of, of well, this is just the background, um, of the, the data that is collected, and we could talk about the collection of data in a, in a minute, um, about the kinds of historical inquiry are possible, not only for the preservation of records that may be deteriorating physically, um, but for being able to utilize information um, that had never been accessible because not comparable before. Um, I'll mention uh, as, um, that while DH as um, a set of practices was um, almost exclusively monolingual um, at its start, it has rapidly taken off into every corner of the world. Um, this is a, a Maghrebi DH project um, that um, is interested in um, collecting and, and marking up oral as well as um, uh, written texts. Um, this is the kind of DH project that has gotten a lot of text, and I'll say something in a second about Franco Moretti's version of this. Um, but the, the notion that you can process many books at once and find something out about them all um, is really a quite interesting um, uh, development from the um, affordances of the technology. Um, historians seem, um, without a, a, a break, to, to know precisely what to do with these tools. Um, and these are visualization tools, um, most importantly, where you would see, in, as in this small representation of 
of this archive, clusters of a, uh, which are the nodes of a network um, where the, uh, uh, the different documents of this archive uh, led in a uh, string search. Um, one of the most successful um, DH projects I know is um, Digital Harlem in New York City, um, Everyday Life 1950 to 1930, in which you can watch over the course of the 15 years what happens to the neighborhood through the relationship between the maps, uh, the census records, and also the arrest records. Um, where arrest records indicate who lived where and when. Um, one of the major new pieces of knowledge that came from this process was um, the, I think for the first time, recognition that Harlem during the day, during those years, was almost empty of black people. Um, where were the black people who lived there? They were working in the other boroughs of New York City. Um, this was um, ferreted out through careful attention to um, uh, archive materials that had never been collated or, or looked at before. Um, finally, you see a variety of different kinds of work from different disciplinary backgrounds. Um, this is a, an online encyclopedia of the First World War. Um, The um, City Theater of Amsterdam is having its uh, performances archived, which means now you, they're accessible in ways that they hadn't been before. Um, you see the variety um, here. This is indicated only by the uh, alphabetical order. Um, uh, European correspondence to Jacob Burkhardt. Uh, which is quite extensive, but had never been studied digitally before. And what happened here, I don't know. Um, I wanted actually, because of our discussion yesterday and today, and, and using Athena's term, uh, the trope and topos of the university, um, to think a little bit about what the digital infrastructure has done to the question of the topos. In the digital age, it is hard to see how locality still matters. Digital media radically attenuate geographical distance, opening up forms of community that transcend solidarities based on language, culture, and place. Um, this is a, um, a given today for people who um, are working in diaspora studies. I know people from South Asia and East Asia. Um, this is um, a, a very common reaction that time as well as space are attenuated, um, but it makes possible new kinds of real-time simultaneous communication that is unheard of prior to these past 10 years or so. I'll stop there. I have other slides I could show you, but I, I wanted you to see what some of these projects look like, since the visual is um, the, a primary component of them. The one example I wanted to mention that has important resonance in literary studies um, is Franco Moretti's computer-assisted reading of 7,000 novels, uh, which disclosed something about late 18th and early 19th century English language novel style that no single human reader would have time enough or world enough to discern. In other words, you can do something with the computer that would be impossible for an ordinary human consciousness to do. Those old enough here to fondly remember structuralism for its decentering of the subject may see in this experiment a kindred inclination. But of course, as with structuralism, Moretti's project can be faulted 
for having presupposed answers to truly vexed questions, among them, what is a novel? What is a period? What is a style? The older computational axiom, garbage in, garbage out, applies pervasively in computer-assisted humanities research, much of which could profit from a mini course on the hermeneutic circle. Ignorance of prior humanity scholarship is, in fact, an unfortunate hallmark of many DH projects. Critics have faulted DH for its lack of theoretical self-reflection, a charge that overall seems to me justified whenever practice, practitioners accept without question a distinction between doing and thinking that seems particularly inappropriate in this context. DH challenges us to rethink from the ground up the supposed exteriority of our tools to the work that we do with those tools between data and text, the intransitive and the transitive. At least at this point, very few have risen to the terms of that challenge. And finally, DH has been criticized justly for the unacknowledged whiteness and maleness of its practitioners, though it may also be fair to say that it has to date been as white and as male as any number of other humanities disciplines. The DH decade has also brought us increasingly inexpensive technology. One can perform Moretti's experiment today on a Chromebook which costs maybe $70. As, and as the costs have come down, its accessibility as a technology worldwide has grown. For somewhat different reasons, DH has become less insistently monolingual during the same time span. Perhaps more trenchant and certainly more vociferous has been the charge, excuse me, that DH is the neoliberal form of the humanities, the version of humanistic work produced in and by an era of metrics. I want to linger a moment on that criticism, made first by Richard Grusin and Wendy Chun, and since taken up by David Columbia and others in a series of blog posts, conference panels, and journal special issues. Grusin asked at the beginning of his article from 2015, the dark side of the digital humanities, whether, quote, it is only an accident that the emergence of the digital humanities has coincided with the intensification of the economic crisis in the humanities in higher education, question mark. Or is there a connection between these two developments? question mark, end of quote. It doesn't take an astute reader long to figure out that Grusin doesn't believe in accidents. In fact, the connection he insinuates is cause and effect, post hoc ergo propter hoc. The neoliberal forces that imperil the university's autonomy have made it possible for DH to prosper. This is also the conclusion reached at the start of a recent online manifesto, Neoliberal Tools and Archives, A Political History of the Digital Humanities. I do not criticize this critique to defend DH or to argue against causes ever producing effects, even if we know that sometimes causes are themselves identifiable as the effects of effects. I take neoliberalism to be a threat to thinking like no other comparable threat in the recent history of the university. But I would argue against the assumption that there can be no accident in a world of metrics, a world that predates the digital humanities by many thousands of years. I think of Plato as the founder of metrical thinking. Here is elsewhere the claims for the novelty of a new technology or medium 
blind us to the recognition that its properties are ancient. The case against DH assumes there are no accidents, that numbers are infallible, and that calculation always succeeds. Perhaps you hear in this last sentence an echo of the bitter dispute between Lacan and Derrida on the itinerary of the signifier in Edgar Allan Poe's short story, The Purloined Letter. Pache Lacan, who insisted that letters always arrive at their destination, Derrida suggested that letters always can go astray. And this capacity for errancy is an irreducible feature of any system of posting. As with letters, so with numbers. We might think about calculation in the same way, as Derrida has in fact suggested in his second death penalty seminar. And here, I want to just to make the, this one. Uh, okay, thank you. Thus, calculation is always busy, preoccupied, interested, put in motion by what remains properly incalculable. If that which is subject to calculation were calculable, if calculation were not always dealing with the incalculable, there would never be any problem. There would never be any problem of criminal law or of the death penalty if calculation calculated what is calculable, calculated with what is calculable. There is calculation and a problem of calculation, a crisis of calculation, indecision or undecidability of calculation. Thus the responsibility of a decision only where, insofar as calculation is always calculating with what is incalculable as well as what is non-calculable, in the same way, in fact, that an incalculable and non-calculable forgiveness must forgive only the unforgivable, we no longer know, we do not yet know what calculation means no more than we know what to decide means, and we must not pretend to know what is calculation in a word if it must always calculate with what is incalculable or non-calculable, where a decision to calculate, a calculating decision, claims to take into account these others of the calculable itself, a mouthful. I wish there were more time for me to read closely this passage and others where Derrida talks about the simultaneous necessity and impossibility of calculation, of calculation ever reaching its destination. The chance of calculation, in short. I would like to propose in conclusion that this paradoxical conjuncture of possibility and impossibility that Athena was also invoking may be what is common both to the digital humanities and to the critical humanities if they are not external to each other. How much time do I have left? Okay, good, good, good. thank you. I'll do this very quickly. I, I do have time at least to show you a project I'm embarked on that is a way of trying to keep together the calculable and the incalculable um, in a project that would be a collaborative, multilingual um, uh, web page, uh, digital edition of the iconic novel by Julio Cortázar Rajuela uh, in English hopscotch. Cortázar published his novel in 1966, the same year in which Lacan published his Écrit. Assuming the voice of Richard Grusin, I could ask, was this an accident? 
The novel begins by inviting its readers to jump around the text. That is, to read the narrative out of its printed linear order. With virtual sleight of hand, the author included a table of directions for timid readers who are, might be nervous about experience, experiencing randomness of giving their reading over to chance. Um, there were, um, and this is, this is Cortázar's direction that this book is above all two books. You can read it from beginning to end, from front to back, as you would read any ordinary novel. Um, if that is how we read ordinary novels. Um, but the second book that is available to you um, would be disclosed if you jumped around in this particular order, supposedly at random. Um, for, for those of you who took the author at his word, you discovered that this is not a random order either. Um, if you followed only the jumping point from each chapter to each chapter, you would not read about a quarter of the novel, which is not indicated in any of these numbers. So this is part of the sleight of hand there. Um, but he was obviously interested, as others at that particular moment think of John Cage, but also of Umberto Eco, of, of works that involve the collaboration of a beholder or a reader. Um, what is a work if it um, plays on, builds in randomness, um, chance elements? Um, if we think of a work as something that is impervious to chance, as something that has been set uh, and archivable, what can you do, what will the archive look like if a work is something like, more like a musical score uh, uh, for a performance than a, um, than uh, a, 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 an invariant text that never changes in time. Um, to read Rajuela as a kind of hopscotch is to understand the novel as a form of software, an attempt to make paper into code. Um, and I, I think, in fact, because of all the people that Cortázar hung around with in the, those heady days of cybernetics, um, this was a possibility that Cortázar actively imagined. Um, excuse me. Um, in conclusion, and this is, again, what was going on in 1966. At the very end of the seminar on the Purloin letter, in a passage that almost nobody reads, mostly because they're exhausted by the time you get to the end of the seminar. Um, there is the parenthesis about parenthesis, or in parenthesis, in which Lacan ruminates on the possibility of chance. Is there such a thing as chance? Um, Lacan ultimately shows us that there is no possibility of chance per se, Chance is, of course, a, a coded term in a long, in a lexicon, um, which means something, which points to something which it can't ever deliver on, which is an experience of pure randomness, something that would be outside signification. Um, through mapping semiotically the relationship between heads and tails as a series of pluses and minuses. Lacan shows that any random order of heads and tails of a coin discloses something that looks incredibly symmetrical. Um, it, it, you know, that there are um, uh, almost organic features here that, um, that uh, demonstrate for Lacan that rather than randomness, there's only random orders. This is, I think, a version of the argument that Derrida would have argued with, um, that there must be some way in which there is chance, even if it doesn't, um, um, even if chance, or precisely because chance, frustrates this kind of capturing. Um, 
um, the, the graphic, the visual representation of chance seems to me my icon for um, the future of the digital humanities and what one might do deconstructively with it. Um, if the project of, um, uh, of, of producing an online collaborative um, uh, edition of a novel takes us closer to it, um, I think that might be one of the new critical tasks of the humanities. <laughs>